Over two and a half million people a year are inflicted with the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. To understand this diagnosis in better detail, it's important to understand a little of the anatomy and the wrist. The carpal tunnel is a tunnel deep in the wrist here that's made up of a, the, the floor of the tunnel is made up of the back of the bones of the wrist. Across that tunnel is a ligament called the transverse carpal ligament, which we'll talk about when we do talk about the surgery for this condition. But with technology today, there's increased use of the fingers flexing through that tunnel that leads to a development of inflammation on the tendons. Within that tight, unyielding space, the inflammation puts pressure on the median nerve, which is a nerve that goes through the tunnel out to the fingers of the hand. Within, from repetitive use with daily activities, with uh, increased computer use, with blackberries, et cetera, our technology has made this a more common occurrence. To discuss a little of the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, the subjective complaints are when a patient comes into my office, one of the first things they talk about is that they have numbness and tingling, more commonly awakening them at night. Commonly it occurs because the nerve goes to these four digits. It's mainly the four di these four digits excluding the little finger. They also, with more pronounced symptoms, may get actually loss of feeling in their hand and actual motor loss of the, of the muscles that allow the thumb to oppose to the digits, resulting in clumsiness with buttoning clothes, using a pen for writing, etc. Under examination, the patient, we tap over the nerve at the tunnel, the median nerve, and if that causes tingling within the fingers, that's suggestive of the diagnosis. We also ask the patients to flex their wrists leading to increased pressure within the carpal tunnel, which is a, called a, a Phelan's test. So that reproduces what happens at night when you're sleeping. You tend to sleep in a fetal position, the wrist drawn up, leading, which causes increased pressure within the carpal tunnel. Also, we look at the, we do a full sensory and a full sensory and motor exam to see if there's loss of feeling and any loss of strength within the thumb muscles. So once we have a proper diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, now it's important to talk about treatment. Treatment, in most cases, with conservative treatment, the symptoms will go away. In severe cases, though, surgery may be necessary. For the conservative treatment, wearing a wrist brace at night when you're sleeping to prevent flexion, flexion of the wrist is important. That's the number one treatment. Also resting the wrist and the fingers, ergonomically looking at the workstation at work if they're a typist or, if, or adjusting the string tension if they're a guitar player, et cetera, uh, anti-inflammatory medication. In some cases, a cortisone shot into the carpal tunnel may also reduce swelling. In more severe cases, though, surgery may be necessary. Now, with the advent of endoscopic carpal tunnel release, surgery is highly effective, but with minimal scarring and a very quick return to work. We do a 10-minute outpatient surgical procedure that involves a one and a half centimeter incision across the crease of the wrist. And the pain and the recovery, the pain is lessened significantly compared to the old-fashioned open procedure, which involved a very lengthy scar across the palm. Now I have patients returning to full work uh, within a month after surgery. So it's highly effective and much less pain than the, than the standard open procedure. Now we'll start with a skin incision. I'm gonna complete the cut proximal. And now I have a U-shaped distal-based flap that we're going to now place a small skin hook on that will essentially be my guide into the carpal tunnel. Forceps, please. Now I'm going to open approximately two centimeters of the anabrachial fascia at the volar midline of the distal forearm, proximal. That'll help facilitate the scope placement into the carpal tunnel. Now we'll take the spatula, and I'm going to run this 
into the carpal tunnel. And I'm going to scrape the undersurface of the transverse carpal ligament just to make sure there's no tenosynovium or lining of the tendons that's adherent to the undersurface of where I'm going to be dividing the transverse carpal ligament. So now we're going in into the carpal tunnel. You can see the transverse carpal ligament fibers. I'm pushing beyond the transverse carpal ligament, beyond the carpal tunnel. Now I'm going to engage the blade, you see right there, and I'm going to cut the, not go all the way to the very end, I'm going to cut the distal fibers here, partially, you see the partial cut there, now the two edges you can see are still intact there, so you got to, if you see those within the viewing surface of the, or within the video monitor, and you haven't, and it's a V-shaped configuration there, you haven't completely transected it. A little fat on the, there we go. So we're gonna complete the transection proximal. We're gonna go all the way, but not to the very edge Approximate. We'll come back and do that with our scissors, distal. Now we, we're going to run the radial column of the transverse carpal ligament all the way proximal, showing complete division except what we're going to complete proximal with our scissors on the way out. And then there's the ulnar column. Again, you don't see the two edges within the view of the scope at any point. So that's open all the way down, and we're going to inspect the median nerve now. You can, through this field, look at the nerve and make sure there's no masses within the carpal tunnel. That's the nerve there. And it's intact after the procedure, which is important, obviously. Okay, come on out. Now we're going to let just apply some uh, pressure to the incision, and we're going to let the tourniquet down now. Tourniquet down, please. <clears throat> it's usually with direct pressure for about five minutes. Is all that's needed to stop any oozing before closing the wound. You can see the fingers pinking up now, all of them and the palm, and I'll just liberally apply some Dermabond skin glue. Dressing, please. I'm just going to put a little little sponge with a tegaderm dressing over it so they can start showering right away. And now they can apply ice post-operatively along with elevation to minimize swelling and can start range of motion of the hand and wrist within the first 24 hours. This procedure, as you can see, involved a very small incision through a minimally invasive approach, as you can see from her left wrist done three months ago. With this latest technology, we are now able to bring life back to her hands.